having not grown up year after year in the in the church I still have to be reminded which Sunday is exactly Christmas Sunday. Is it the one that comes before or the one that comes after? Um, to me, uh, it, it usually makes most sense to the one that's closest to it, whether it becomes before or after, but I'm always corrected by the elders. So we come to this Christmas Sunday, and I wanted to start a new series, a new series for us. And I've entitled this series, The Coming of the Lord Jesus, Anticipating, Apathetic, or Antagonistic. And over these many weeks, in introducing these Christmas hymns, new and old, I've been trying to encourage you and encourage my own heart to think about entering into the anticipation, the waiting, the longing, the seeking as a treasure the Messiah, as the Old Testament saints had, did, had done. They waited. They longed. They looked. They anticipated and sought after when would the Messiah come? When would God fulfill his promises? And it, it seemed to be really, really dark at times. Whether it was because of the deportation, they, they were taken out of the land, whether it was even as they came back and they rebuilt the temple and they, the, the temple was so much smaller, so much less magnificent than what the, the older believers remembered. Whether it was the 400 years of silence, they kept wondering and seeking and searching when and how the Messiah would come. Who would he be? And as I've been encouraging our hearts towards that, with songs like, Oh, come all ye faithful, hark the herald angels sing, even O holy night, the unbelievable, whether, whatever it was, my prayer for your heart and mine is that we would shake off the dust of familiarity and break through the callousness of tradition and rightfully be amazed and wonder at the incarnation of God the Son. And again, for this Christmas Sunday, we celebrate year after year and have opportunity to celebrate the incarnation. What we wait for as the church is his glorification. Where he will come and reign on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. And what we should all be praying about is to have this Old Testament heart of seeking as a treasure, waiting for and longing for God and his Messiah to come again. And we should be praying to guard against a heart that doesn't seek, that doesn't care about the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah and King. We should pray that God will work in our hearts to soften it, to ache and long and anticipate the coming of Christ. And we should pray against any hardness, any callousness, any apathy, and any antagonism that we might have at his coming. So some passages in the Old Testament that I've sought having to do with not seeking the Lord, having a hardened heart, not caring about what God says, would be found in examples like Psalm 10. Verse 4, the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. We should guard ourselves against that. In Psalm 14, starting in verse 1, also a parallel passage in Psalm 53, verses 1 through 3, says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. God is looking from heaven to see if there are any who understand and seek after God. And what is the sad assessment? Verse 3, they have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. 
in Isaiah chapter 9, after the great prophecy, he's talking about his nation, the nation of Israel and the times where he has had to discipline them because of their sin. And he starts in verse 13 and says, Yet the people do not turn back to him who struck them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. So what, what does the Lord do in response to their not seeking the Lord of hosts? So the Lord cuts off head and tail from Israel, both palm branch and bulrush in a single day. The head is the elder and honorable man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. For those who guide this people are leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are brought to confusion. Therefore, the Lord does not take pleasure in their young men, nor does he have pity on their orphans or their widows. For every one of them is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth is speaking foolishness. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. And again, Isaiah 31, verse, third, uh, verse 1, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Having a heart that does not, does not care to seek the Lord, we should count as very, very serious. I mean, you read through those passages and think through them. If you trust in horses and chariots, your own ingenuity, your own resources, your own finances, and you do not seek the Lord, the curses of God be upon you, it says. If you don't seek the Lord, even despite his own loving chastening, God will cut you off. In the New Testament in John chapter 1, the Apostle John captured this wicked heart that does not seek him. In John 1, he, verse 10, he says, He, the Lord Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Or, in John chapter 3, starting in a very, very familiar passage in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So God sending his Son the first time was not to judge the world, condemn the world in judgment. He came to save those who would believe. He came because of great love. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged to condemnation. He who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for the for fear that his deeds will be exposed but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in god these are the things that we should pray against that god would guard us against that we would ever be a people when the light of Christ comes through his word that we would be a people that would hate the light and love the darkness. That God forbid it, that that would be ever true of us. Instead, here are some passages that exemplify a heart that seeks after God. Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. This one thing. What is this one thing? The one thing that you cannot do without. The one thing that you must have. The one thing that you must possess in your life. Is it God in his nearness? Psalm 27 again, verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. 
When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall see. Or Psalm 63, starting in verse 1, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Or Psalm 119, verse 2, How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. We ought to be a people who seek after God. Very much like the faithful Old Testament saints did when they waited for the Messiah to come. In terms of James, which we have been studying and meditating through recently, I have prayed for my heart as I have prayed for yours, that you would be eager and quick to listen to God's word about the incarnation of Christ. That you would be slow to speak against or speak despisingly or belittlingly about the truths of the incarnation of Christ. And finally, that you would be slow to be angry or resistant to the truths of the incarnation of Christ. Now, hearing that, you might say, what? This is, this is Christmas Sunday. Who doesn't like Christmas? <laughs> How can I despise and belittle the truths of the Incarnation? Or how in the wide world would I ever be angry because of or resist the truths of the Incarnation? Well, let's stop and think about those who found themselves at the first Christmas. And as a side note, you know, hopefully you know, that the Lord Jesus was not born in December. Right? This is just a time where it's been decided that we will, we will me, uh, remember and celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus. It would have been too cold, way too cold in December for him to be born in a cattle stall. It would have been way too cold for the shepherds to be out watching their sheep at night. But having said that, as far as despising and belittling, belittling the truths of the Incarnation... Think about how our celebration of Christmas might very well be like how the Israelites celebrated the Passover. Passover after Passover. They were supposed to glorify God, to remember the miraculous deliverance of God's people from Egypt and God's faithfulness to his promises. And they were also to teach the younger generations of the significance of the Passover. This was supposed to be built in year after year after year. But think through biblical history. How over time it became commercialized. That's why Jesus came into the temple and cleansed the temple. There were money changers. There were people who sell at, at extortion prices doves and lambs and sheep and goats and bulls. From people who travel from long, long ways away. They just made it a commercialized thing. It was no longer about coming to the house of God to pray and to seek the Lord and to wait upon him. Over time, the Passover, it was too easy to neglect. Ah, it's so far. Too much effort. Over time, it was just about being freed from Egypt's oppression, freed from slavery, as opposed to celebrating the triumph of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over the gods of the most powerful empire at the time, Egypt. Over time, the Passover became just about family togetherness as opposed to celebrating God's faithfulness. Over time, it just came to be about the religious motions even, just go through the religious motions, but their heart was far from God. Isn't that, sadly, a little close to home and how we might celebrate Christmas? Think of how they despised the incarnation. Think of how they despised and belittled the fact that the Messiah would come. Also think about Think about how many people just went about their lives, buying and selling, going and coming from work, eating and drinking, sleeping and waking up, 
and totally missing the fact that the light of the world had come into the, in, uh, into the earth to shine his truth, holiness, and goodness and salvation into a dismally dark world. Think about how few people recognized it. How can we dis despise and belittle the incarnation? Think about Matthew 13, starting in verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, what are these parables? Some of those parables you can read in Matthew 13 were the parable of the soils, right? The hidden treasure, the pearl of great price. After finishing these parables, he departed from there. Verse 54, he came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? So, mark it. He was teaching them about the kingdom and how the kingdom, in, in a couple of his parables, was the most treasured, valuable thing. And that he warned them in the parable of the soils, you need to be careful how you listen to God's word. Don't harden your heart. Don't, don't fall away when the persecution comes. Don't get choked out because you have cares and worries and love for the things of the world. And when he came to his hometown, they understood. The Lord Jesus, or this Jesus, could teach like no other. And this Jesus did things that no person could ever do. They recognized that miracles were happening through him. And instead of like O Holy Night calls us to, falling on their knees and receiving the gift of heaven. Verse 55, they said this. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Aren't are they, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Think about the rich young ruler. How do we despise and belittle the incarnation? The fact that Jesus, God the Son, took upon himself human flesh. How do we despise that? Well, the, the rich young ruler, as you, as you kind of uh, piece together the different accounts, it's as if he runs and slides on his knees before the Lord Jesus. And he says, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus responds to him, verse 17, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Only God is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then the rich young ruler said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not, uh, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he highlights most of the, the part of the Ten Commandments that have to do with loving your neighbor, except for thou shalt not covet. He doesn't talk about, you shall have no other gods before me, right? You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And mark how this young ruler responds. Verse 20, the young men said, All these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? What did the rich, wrong, rich young ruler say? In response to the teacher who told him, There is only one who is good. The rich young ruler says, I'm good. Jesus said to him, verse 21, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and mark it. You will have treasure in heaven. Listen, get rid of this junk, the treasures of this world, and you will in exchange have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. And this rich young ruler, 
Did he understand and appreciate the economies of heaven? That compared to the riches and the treasures in heaven and following Christ, that everything in this world, even the best things, are just sewage in comparison? Did he do that? No. He despised and belittled the truths of the incarnation, that Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, was calling him to make this exchange and follow him. And he said, when the young man heard the statement, he went away grieving. Why? Because he was one who owned much property. And again, other times where people would come and profess with their lips, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds pretty good, right? And Jesus responds, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Will you follow me now? And the implication is, in the context, is that they said no. Others would say, he would call others to follow him. And he says, well, Lord, let me do this first. Let me bury my father. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus responds, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. All these people said, you know what? I want to follow Jesus, but not as my only treasure, just one of many. So let me do this first before I follow Christ. Let me enjoy my treasures here, and then I will follow Christ. Is this something that we do when we think about the incarnation that Christ left the glories of heaven being God, very God, where Philippians would say that he did not, he regarded equality with God, not something to be held on to. He was equal with God, God, very God, and then he became what he was not, fully man at the same time. And then the incarnation, you can say, eh, where are my presents? Eh, it's all about family. Eh, just another Christmas. Instead of being struck with wonder and awe again, that God would condescend himself and be made in the likeness of men and be found in appearance as a man. How about being angry and resisting the truths of the Incarnation? You say, well, how can I be angry at that? Maybe, maybe, Pastor Eric, I, I despise and belittled it. I have not treasured the Incarnation and Christmas. I have not treasured the truths of Christ becoming man and being born in a manger as was foretold. I have not treasured it like I should. Okay, I can see that. But being angry? Resistant? Antagonistic? No. How can that be? Well, think about when the Lord Jesus came to earth. He was, according to the promise of Isaiah 9, it says this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. When Jesus was born, right? He, he was born as a child. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. But this son, at the same time that, that as, as he was born, he was born Mighty God. That's his name. That's who he is. And father of eternity. I know it says eternal father. And that might be hard to, uh, to reconcile. I thought he was the son. How can he be the father? He, he is the father of eternity. So bor though born in time, he is the source of timelessness.
That's why in Matthew 1, 18, Matthew describes the birth of Jesus Christ as follows. When his, Mary, his, excuse me, when his mother Mary had betrothed, been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yahweh saves his people. Jesus. Yahweh saves. And this explanation is given. You shall call his name Yahweh saves. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Now, there are many people who were named Jesus at the time. Yeshua, Joshua. There were many people who have been had that namesake, but not a single one, except for the Lord Jesus. Not a single one could have said, been said of them. He will save. My name is Yahweh saves, and I will save the people from their sins. Not, not one would say that. Not one would be able to say that, except for Jesus. He was God who would save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which translated means God with what this immediately meant is that Jesus is God and everybody else is not. Jesus is king and everybody is else is not. Jesus, what Jesus says goes, not what you and I say. What matters most is Jesus, not you. And not me. But see, if you stop and think about it, the fact that even when the baby was born, he incited hatred. Because of this very truth. He didn't come just as, an, as a regular person. Even a great person. He wasn't born like that. He wasn't the, the, a good uh, prophet. He wasn't a good teacher only. He wasn't just a, only a moral example. He was all those things, but so much more. He was God. And because he's God, that means no one else is. And whatever he says goes, that he is king, and you and I are not. See, Herod understood this. King Herod, he was not of the kingly line, nor of the Davidic line. But he was appointed as king by the Romans, the ruling empire. And see, he understood when Jesus came... born king of the Jews, he was threatened by a baby. And as the account goes, wise men from the east came. There's, they saw a star, a light, and they followed the light to Jerusalem. And they inquired in Jerusalem and says, hey, we're looking for your Messiah. Where is, to, where is he to be born? So then Herod asked his Counselors, And they, like good people, would go to the book of Micah and understand that God would fulfill his promise. And in the city of Bethlehem, the city of David, the Messiah would be born. And they got that right. And so then Herod says, hey, you go and carefully search for this child. Now, Bethlehem wasn't a big town, right? That's why you're seeing a little town of Bethlehem, right? Not a big town, but big enough. Big enough. You got to go look for a child. Okay. And they did. They looked. They were helped by a, a, a moving star. I don't know how that happened, but God did it. And in Herod's mind, in his plan, he says, he's about two years old. 
all the babies, boys, from two years old and under, kill them. Think about that. Where is the Messiah, the anointed king? He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay. You go look for him, and you tell me where he is. They didn't. They didn't come back and tell him, being warned by God. And so what did he do? He did exactly what Satan wanted him to do. Satan knew that there will be a son born of the Davidic line who will come and crush his head. So then what would Satan do? He's not omniscient, right? He doesn't know everything. But how does he respond? Well, then you kill all the baby boys. Slaughter them all. Think about the religious leaders and how they hated the fact that Jesus in his incarnation. Think about the times they sought to stone him. Think about the times they sought to entrap him and trick him. Think about the times they sought to kill him because the people were hanging on his every word. They sought to kill Jesus because they were jealous. In John chapter 11, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, this is how the the religious leaders responded. Raised from the dead. Okay? Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. And if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So, skipping down to verse 53. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. They couldn't deny that Jesus was performing miracles. They couldn't deny that Lazarus, who was dead, was raised to life. They could not deny that. But did they bow? No. Did they love it? That the incarnated Christ was there? No, they hated it. Why? Because they could not get what they wanted. What they wanted was not going to happen if Jesus was God. After the triumphal entry, you know, all the people of, of Jerusalem, they were seeing the Messiah approach and they were shouting, Glory to God, Hosanna, Hosanna. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the Pharisees, did they join in? No. Did they see that Scripture was fulfilling itself when Jesus, the Messiah, ride, rode in on the foal of a donkey? What do they say? Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Stop this. Stop this. And Jesus responds, if I, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when I had a chance to go to Israel, a, a sweet, dear uh, lady, sister in Christ, said, uh, remarking about how many stones there were, <laughs> wow, that would have been loud. If the people stopped praising, there's so many stones, it would have been such loud praise. And how did they respond? After the triumphal entry, it says, the Pharisees said to one another after that time, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Even Pilate, I found this really interesting. You know that the time where the, the governor Pilate not a Jew, part of the Roman Empire, and part of the, 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 the time was he would release one of the Jewish prisoners. He says, hey, do you want me to release Jesus? Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And he said that. He wasn't a nice man. He was... This is kind of a dig. But verse 10, he says, the reason why he asked this, do you want me to release the king of the Jews, even though they were asking for Barabbas, this insurrectionist, do you want me to release Jesus, the king of the Jews? Why did he ask that? 
Verse 10, for he was aware that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. Why did the chief priest and the Pharisees hand Jesus over? This unbelieving Pilate knew, oh, it's because you're jealous of him. Listen, these examples that I'm bringing out of those who despise and belittle the incarnation, those who hated the incarnation, that God would help us, that we would not respond the same. They, they understood that when Jesus came into the world, it, it wasn't just, it was monumental. It was life-changing. So if you're going to celebrate Christmas on this Christmas Sunday, in, in six days, right? In six days, if you're going to celebrate Christmas and take the time during the year that has been afforded to us to celebrate Christmas, my prayer is that you would not celebrate like these. To belittle and despise and say, it's just, just another holiday. Even more so that you would not be antagonistic to the incarnation and fight and resist and rebel against the fact that God, very God, has come to earth and has laid claim upon you. He says, I am your king. Come and follow me. That you would not despise him and say, well, I have other things to do first. I have more important things. I'll get to you later. Yes, you might be two, three, four priorities down, but you're still up there in the top ten, Jesus. Or far worse, they say, how dare you try and tell me what to do? How to think, how to live. But instead of being like this, quickly, let's think about two groups of people who look to the Messiah. The shepherds and the wise men. The shepherds in Luke chapter 1. They were out watching their flocks by night. And suddenly, after 400 years of silence to them, and the angels came. Uh, sorry, Luke chapter 2. Starting in verse 8, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is the anointed King Christ Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Gloria in excelsis Deo, if they were speaking Latin. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. And when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began to say, saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Now again, this is not just a story, right? This really happened. These shepherds who are on the outskirts of town because they were the low, low rung of society, they stunk, nobody, nobody wanted to be around the stinky shepherds. He said, he will be a baby. The God, the Messiah, will be a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Let's go look for him. That would be like, hey, uh, I want you to go to Kaiser Hospital or Cedar sinai Hospital 
and look for a baby with purple blanket and wings. Go and do that. Now, if you've ever walked around the hospital like that, Kaiser or Cedar sinai that is not an easy thing. They had to see. Is this the one? Nope. Is this the one? Nope. Is this the one? Nope. Time and time again, they had to search. And Scripture doesn't say how long they did, but they found the Messiah. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. There wasn't anything more important. And when they couldn't find him at first, they didn't give up. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. Is this your heart? There's so many things that come as treasures before you. Do you seek after Christ, the only treasure? Are you seeking for him such that when these other treasures come, he's like, nope, not it. Nope, not it. Nope, not it. This is not the Messiah. We will keep looking and enduring in our seeking after him until we find him. And when we find him, we will rejoice and praise God. Similarly, the wise men. The wise men in the book of Matthew As I mentioned to you, they were told by Herod, King Herod, to search carefully. Now, as I mentioned to you, they had a divinely appointed star to shine the way to the Lord Jesus. So their their searching was a little bit easier, right? There's a divinely appointed light from heaven to shine the way to Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, the King. And even though we don't have that light, we can also, with like them, search carefully. But the light that we have is not a divinely appointed star, but we have the light of God's word. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In Philippians 2, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach, in, in, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. How do you appear as lights? Well, you don't grumble. You don't, um, you don't dispute with God. And at the same time, you are holding fast the word of life. Now, this all is an introduction <laughs> to the series of what I entitled The Coming of the Lord Jesus. Are you anticipating? Are you apathetic? Or are you antagonistic? Because if I, as I kept thinking about what passage should we go through, what passage so that we can enter in all the more to be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus, like the Old Testament saints, it dawned on me, God has given us that passage. And for the the coming weeks in the next series, as we're thinking about the being ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus, I want us to go through the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. Because you think about it. Jesus, the glorified one who has eyes of flaming fire, hair like white wool, feet like burnished bronze, his face shone brighter than the sun, who walks among the lampstands, his church. And he writes a message to the church as they're supposed to be what? Waiting for his coming. I think it would be very, very instructive and needful for us to take heed and listen to the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And that's why God gave it to us. 
Well, I'll show you that when we get there. But this is an introduction. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus? If you're ready, rightly, then you'll be anticipating his coming. That he is God and you are not. That he is the king and you are not. He came to save people from their sins. He came to save you from their sin, your sins. Have you come to submit to that or are you fighting? And I recognize on a Christmas Sunday like this, some people only come during Christmas time. Is this just another thing that you do? Or are you anticipating the Lord Jesus who's come and will come again? Or, and I hope this is not true of you, are you apathetic or are you antagonistic? My hope is that we would learn to love the Lord Jesus more and more. So let's pray together. Let's pray. And then we'll be dismissed. Father, again, I was always just, in one sense, had a long devotion, meditation to consider where our hearts are in light of not only your son's first coming, but his coming again. I pray that you would help us to be found faithful, longing, waiting, treasuring, seeking after him, not dull-hearted, not callous, not apathetic, not even antagonistic, that we would love that the Lord Jesus would reign not only in our hearts, but in every heart who would believe that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us, we pray. I pray for those who don't know you, either visit or visiting online, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. I pray that you would help them to honestly assess themselves in light of your word and the truths that they have heard. And they would recognize that the Lord Jesus who calls out to them, who came to die in their place, that they would submit and love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen.